I don't know what Paul's going to share, but he can take whatever time he wants to. Thank you. Well, um, when I became a new Christian, um, an elderly, very elderly man in the church in Austin, Texas, he gave me um, the autobiography of George Mueller, the short version. Uh, he gave me Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret and Why Revival Tarries. And, uh, and those books had a tremendous um, impact on my life with regard to the reality of God in that um, to believe Him in prayer, to maintain secret fellowship with Him, um, to expect to cry out to Him for hours and days and weeks and months, but to an ex expect an answer. Uh, to trust Him by faith. As a matter of fact, all of Heart Cry is based upon all the financial principles of that first book that I was given, that we would never um, raise funds, that we would never make our needs known. We would only tell people what we were doing and to see the extraordinary um, bountiful blessings of God are, over the last three decades have been due in part to learning from those books. Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret, although some of the things in the book, I probably would have written them differently. Um, the book itself is extraordinary on a life of faith that the more that you trust in the arm of the flesh, the less you will see the arm of God. And that was key to everything. Another monumental book. Um, I talked to Ian Murray a couple years ago, and he said it really wasn't one of his most popular books. But for me, it was life changing. When I was a young man, uh, having already passed probably six years of learning to pray, to tarry with the Lord, to wait upon him, but always really trying to figure out um, to know that uh, life without the Spirit or an apathetic life toward the Spirit was powerless. And yet looking on the other side and seeing all the uh, just the falsities, the shenanigans of those who claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, Ian Murray's book, Pentecost Today, on such things as baptism of the Spirit, fullness of the Spirit, um, I felt like was life-changing for me. I was actually there in lectures, the lectures when he gave them, and then later it became a book. And when people ask me, you know, Brother Paul, you talk a lot about prayer and the power of God, and, and, um, and I said, well, listen, instead of listening to me for three hours, go on, just buy uh, Ian Murray's book, because he solidly reformed he quotes Puritans and reformers and their relationship, living, vital relationship with the Holy Spirit. And uh, you'll begin to see, I think, what I saw, the reality, the reality uh, that's there, that God uh, can be more real to you than everybody else in the room with you. Um, and that absolute necessity of, of prayer. And when we approach the scriptures, when we approach the scriptures, we must understand they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. The grammar is inspired. The word choice is inspired. It's, it's inspired. It's inerrant. It's infallible. And um, if we ever come to an interpretation that is um, in anywhere, any way contrary to the grammar, we have the wrong interpretation. And, and that is so true. That is one of the main principles of hermeneutics. But also realize that a carnal mind is just not going to get it. Even when they can write it out on paper, they're just not going to understand it, not going to be able to apply it. So in our in our study of Scripture, prayer is an absolute. It's absolute essential. We must must breathe prayer. Uh, one of the things that I learned um, from books has been don't pray unless you expect an answer. 
And if you pray generally, the answers will be general. So general and vague, you won't be able to tell whether or not the prayer was answered. Pray specifically. Trust God. Tarry with God. Wrestle with God. I hate to use that kind of terminology uh, because young believers will not have the depth of reverence they need to use the terminology wrestle with God. So you have to balance your idea of struggling before the throne of God, of grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar. You have to balance that with a deep, profound reverence because of whom you're approaching. Um, my relationship with books, um, you would be surprised at how few books I read. Now, that's not a really good thing to say when you're up here promoting books. Um, but let me explain myself. Very rarely do I read a modern book. Um, that's not because there's not good ones. Um, but the way I do my life is a little bit different. Um, my starting point for reading a book is always the scripture. So I believe that one of the main principles of Bible hermeneutics is almost never mentioned today. And that is we always do our theology in the context of the church. We always do our hermeneutic, our exegesis in the context of the church. Now, what does that mean? That, you know, if, if you have, a, say, some wild TV preacher standing here and you ask him why he believes something and he says, because that's what my Bible says. And then you ask me, why do you believe the contrary, Mr. Washer? And I go, because that's what my Bible says. Well, obviously, one of us is wrong. He may even go to grammar. I will go to grammar. He may go to context. I will go to context. But there's something that you need to understand. We have 2,000 years of church history. If everybody is in agreement, every godly Bible-believing man and woman is agree in agreement for 2,000 years, and I disagree with them, then who's probably wrong? Me. And that's why, that's why we need to read. To make sure that we are maintaining ourselves in the very center of the evangelical faith. And I, I, it's hard for me to use the word evangelical today because it doesn't mean anything. But I mean the historic evangelical faith. And so we, we keep ourselves by reading other men, particularly different groups of men down through history, we know that we're keeping ourselves in the evangelical faith. The other thing is what we glean from them. What we glean from them. Uh, that there is, uh, we are a stupid people. I don't want to be offensive, but we are. Uh, we are a stupid culture. We, we are. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, Watts book on logic when when I um, when I graduated from seminary and I graduated very high. I'm just saying that so that you understand the rest of the thing. Um, a friend of mine from Canada sent me a book on logic. I read through the first chapter three times to make sure that I was understanding the terminology and logic. You have to define terms before you can argue them. <coughs> so I read through it three times. I thought I've never had anything this difficult. And uh, I went in the kitchen to get a glass of milk, came back and just happened to look at the ink sketching on the cover. And I couldn't put the title of the book together with the ink sketching because the ink sketching had what looked like a headmaster standing there, leaning over a group of children that looked to be about nine years old. And I said, this is the most difficult logic I've studied, whether at the university or masters. And uh, so I looked it up and it was uh, the uh, logic primer for grade school children in the colonial period. And so when we begin to read, when I read, for example, struggle with Jonathan Edwards or John Owen until I can start speaking their language, I begin to, it be, begins to raise the bar, raise the bar, raise the bar. So um, my, my study for sermons is a little bit different. I've, I've never, as a matter of fact, Matt help, Mac helped me with this years ago when I came through a crisis is I really don't hardly study for sermons. I, I know that's just heretical. Um, I, I spend several hours a day studying, and I mean that literally. Um, 
but when I come to a place, I, I like, I want to see, I want to sense what do the people need when I talk to them? Where are they? What's going on? I just, now I know everybody's not supposed to do that, but that's what I do. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong as an island, I'm wrong. But that's what I do. And I became so convinced that I needed to do everything else like everybody else does that I got to the point where I couldn't even preach. I told Mac that years ago and he said, look, you're not everybody else, you're you. It'd be different if you didn't study, but you study all the time. So I've spent my life just trying to study the Bible. And when I was in Peru, my main ministry was travel for two and a half days by mule back of grain trucks stand on a hill with 400 mountain men and for several hours a day. OK, first question, second question, third question. So there, there was no script. And so what I've tried to do in my studies is this. Um, I, I want to study the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. One of the things I've discovered about the Puritans and the Reformers is, well, when, you know, when someone asks us a question about the Holy Spirit, we'll usually go to Acts 2 or John 14 or John 16. They went to some obscure text in Zephaniah somewhere. It's because they knew the Bible. I am amazed all these young Reform guys. It's like as soon as they become Reformed, the, the 66 books of the canon turn into just two, Romans and Ephesians. And they can't understand either one of those books because they haven't read the whole thing. And so it's usually when I'm dealing with a text, it's going to take me to a book. Some book. I have Martin's book on a guide to the Puritans so that you can look up any verse and he'll have a guide there. This Puritan wrote on this verse. This reformer wrote on this verse. And then I have a literal something I really don't want to give you guys. But because uh, it's my secret weapon. <laughs> um, it's called uh, Encyclopedia Puritanica. And it's just a little CD that was made several years ago. I think you can still find it online. And I can go to that CD. I can click on any verse in the Bible and it'll sometimes have 40, 50, 60 references where the Puritans wrote on that. And not only that, I can click it and it takes me right to the reference. And so most of my studying of books has to do with I'm studying a text or I'm studying a, a doctrine. A doctrine. And then I just shoot off. So I have in my library, it's mainly collections. You know, one of the most modern would be Martin Lloyd-Jones. I have every, you know, everything I could get by him. Everything from Spurgeon all the old Puritans, the, the, but mainly, again, works, works, works. I, I, um, I really, I, I should spend more time reading a lot of modern books, but uh, I just work that way. That's the way God's made me. And then um, just toward uh, what I decided when I was young, um, I guess I was in my maybe 24, I decided that I wouldn't be able to know everything. And um, I wanted to spend my life working on something that was important. And I couldn't think of anything more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for the last uh, three decades, sometimes two hours a day, sometimes 12 hours a day, I've taken every verse uh, that has to do with Jesus pre-incarnation and glory all the way to his seat in glory as the God man. Do all the Greek and Hebrew work on it that I can do. Go to other works to check out, especially when I'm working with the Septuagint. And then research every one of those texts from second century to Martin Lloyd-Jones and try to pull out everything that men from history have that would make me weep over Christ and collect that. And so John Flavel is one of my his meditorial glories. First volume. Absolutely astounding. I love Flavel. Um, um, Winslow, Octavius Winslow. 
I love, who knows Octavius Winslow, anyone here? Beauty, just get it, everything. Philpot, another one. These, you know, I, there, there's all these men that no one's ever heard of. And then the patristics are very difficult to work with because there was the influx of Platonic philosophy and everything else and the, all the battles that went on, but the patristics uh, studying them, first five centuries, very worthwhile. Here's one thing that I really want to recommend. Uh, I've been you know, known as a guy who's preaching about many Americans do not have biblical assurance. You know, They think they're saved because one time they prayed a prayer. And I remember how many years it took me to work through Scripture to come to the point of what I believed. And then I remember reading, I think it was the Heidelberg, and going, why did I spend a decade and a half having to learn this and reinvent the wheel when it was set out there perfectly? Do not neglect the confessions or the catechisms. There's the, the Westminster and then the, the Baptist, the 1689, which was to show that Baptists are also in, in that Reformed Protestant camp in the sense of we believe. Um, the, um, let's see, Keech's Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. If you really want to study theology, you will not believe it. Go and look up Fisher's Catechism because it takes the Westminster and explains Anything that has the shorter catechism and for every question, there's a hundred. It goes through propitiate. It goes through everything like you could not believe. So the Heidelberg, the Belgic. Um, I'm Baptist. The Dutch Reformed men have been a tremendous blessing to me. Some of the sweetest piety in, in the world. So. Read, read books, but, but make sure, like, let me explain something to you. And I don't think it's mystical. But it's not mystical at all. It's just common sense, maybe. But if I have two men standing here and both of them have the exact theology, the exact same theology, and it's good theology, but one of them got theirs out of the Bible and the other one got theirs out of good books, now, the one who got his out of the Bible confirmed it with good books, I can assure you, and picked up things from good books because wisdom will not wasn't born with you and it won't die with you. But if I have those two men, I'll be able to tell you which one got their stuff from the Bible. Because only the Bible can keep you from being a parrot. Parrots can say all kinds of stuff and they don't understand anything of what they're saying. Only the Bible can keep you from being a parrot. I have young men, listen to me. Some of you are very zealous and you want to be in the ministry and you're goodly men. You're not you're not false. But just ask yourself this question and be honest. How many times have you read the Bible from Genesis, the, the book of Revelation? I know guys who've graduated from seminary who haven't done that. We need to read the Bible and read the Bible. And read. I just finished a three month uh, just going through the servant songs. I mean, I'm going to be 60 in a few months. I've been doing this since I was 21 and I just went through an in-depth study of the servant songs and it revealed so many things about Jesus Christ. I never really understood. You see, you can take You could take Hebrews 10, for example. Hebrews 10 is, is kind of like a, I don't know, it's, it's like if you were to weave something and it all, all the weave came together in one specific place and it held it all together. Hebrews 10 is a lot like that, at least for the book, but almost in the entire economy of God. And you begin to see, I, I would study that. I spent several months in that chapter and I would come out of my office and I'd constantly go to the guys who I work with and goes, this book. It was written by God. No one could write this book but God. 
And so what you need to see is when you read through the Bible, you're going to have a tendency to go, I read this. No, you didn't. It, it is such an intricately woven tapestry of divine genius that you could literally take John 316, spend 85 years on it, and you would not even have you wouldn't even gotten close. You will be in eternity. Someone asked me when when I get to heaven, will I know everything? I said, well, you'll know a lot, but no, you won't know everything. That's part of what eternity. Do you realize eternity would be an insane asylum? Think about it. You can only walk down streets of gold so long and it becomes really boring. You can only swing on gates of pearl, you know, for a little while. And then it's like, what am I doing? And that's that's actually a philosophical problem with regard to eternity. But if it goes on forever, will it not become so mundane? And yes, the answer is yes. If all that was there was creation, even the most spectacular, perfect creation. But see, that's not what's just there. There is an infinite God. So you will be in eternity for an eternity of eternities, and you will not even reach the foothills of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you so much and much of what I'm telling you right now, some of it, yeah, hard work. But, you know, a lot of it is just reading. You know, Owen. Jonathan Edwards, Flavel, Bates, William Bates, Brackle. Joel Beakey, because he's actually 10,000 years old, just no one else knows it. <laughs> he's written so many books, he has to be that old. I asked him the other day, what color was Noah's Ark? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, um, Joel is actually a really good um, example. People say Martin Lloyd-Jones was the last Puritan. No, Joel Beakey. <laughs> and... Um, uh, one of the things, you know, if you know Mac, uh, stay around him because he's kind of opened up my life to different different people I would have never known about or never been able to draw from. So, yeah, read good books, but the scriptures, the scripture and, and Mac, you know, that's what Mac is saying. It's the same thing Mac is saying. He's had a lot more experience with good books than I have, and I wish I'd read more. But he would say the same thing. Oh, don't neglect the Scriptures. And, and study those books that will help you understand the Scriptures. Okay. Well, is there any questions? No. Okay, good. I did. Oh, there's one. Yeah, primary documents. Well, it's the same primary document. For example, there was this huge argument going on in this university campus, and my wife looked at me. It's like almost a brawl was going to break out. My wife looked at me and goes, "You need to get in there and do something." So I <laughs> said, "Okay." So all these people are fighting with this preacher who was one of those hate preachers, and this one girl kept screaming out about Lilith, Lilith, and all these different Gnostic ideas. And so I just screamed out to the crowd, primary documents. And everyone turned around like a bunch of wolves in the cameras. And I said, primary documents. And it was like college student. They couldn't even understand what I was talking about. They said, what do you mean? I said, primary documents. And, and like, why you? I said, you made a truth claim. You made a truth claim. So what's your primary document? Not your secondary document, not who wrote about who wrote about who wrote about what said that. Have you read that? Now defend it. And it was like a hundred kids or something. Up, and they just walked away because they, they had no primary document. Um, if you look at closely, especially the Westminster, you know, they talk about all the confessions and the books. If the confessions can say this, the books definitely must say it. They call themselves subordinate standards. 
always subordinate standards. There's a supreme standard, and that's the word of God. Everything else is subordinate. And the, and the crafters of the good confessions were always very careful to say that. Any other question? Yes? The sermon prep tip, you used two words that I didn't quite catch. Was encyclopedia what? <laughs> Purit Puritanical or Puritanical. They're trying to write it kind of all Latinish, but um, it, it actually comes out with um, Joel Beakey's group or something had to do with it. I came across it. Nobody knows about it. Everybody's like, what, do you read Puritans like 20 hours a day? I'm going, no, but I don't really want to tell you what my secret weapon is. But it's just a little CD, and it's really, some people told me that they can't hardly find it on the internet anymore, but it's old school CD. And you go on there and you click Scripture, and the Scriptures come up, and you click Isaiah 53, 6, go over here, and there's all these Puritans. And reform guys, and you click on it, and it just pops up. And sometimes it's just a verse; it's just a reference. But then sometimes you'll, you know, you have that verse, and all of a sudden, you know, Thomas uh, Boston comes up, and he wrote 800 pages on it. You know, and then you got to we, you know, read through it all. But that's been a big help for me. Big help. All right. Yes. The Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, all these Westminster divines were brought together to write out a clear document of the Christian faith. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, most of them, um, of course, of the Presbyterian persuasion. And so the Baptist wanted to, the, the confession is wonderful, and the Baptist recognized it, but the Baptist in the 1689 also made it their own, changing a few areas with regard to baptism and with regard to church government, and maybe a few other, but in many places, it's word for word the same. The, the Keech's Catechism, the Keech, K-E-E-C-H, there's a Spurgeon's Catechism, really good for children, there's a prove it to me catechism uh, that's very, very good for children. And then, uh, but if you look up Fisher's catechism, he's actually, I think, the son in law of Erskine or something, but he continued on the work. It's Fisher's catechism. And it, it just goes through intricately through every major doctrine with a question and an answer, question, answer, question, answer. And I think it's very productive. I, I love Fisher's Catechism. I, I go to it a lot. And, and then there was the, the, the Heidelberg and then the Belgic. Uh, um, they're, they're all good. Okay. Thank you. Yes? Well, well, there's, let me just say this, there's prayer with your boots on and your boots off. There's Bible study with your boots on and boots off. Now, what does that mean? Um, for me, if, if, if my devotional time is my Bible study time, then I'm going to end up wrangling with some Greek preposition. All right, do I really want to do that for my devotional time? Not often. So I, I took up the thing of boots on, boots off. So when I get up in the morning, it's boots off. That means this is just enjoying. So I'm going to read the Bible with, a, you know, everybody's going to hate me now, but with a cup of coffee, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to read it from Genesis to Revelation. And my capacity is three chapters. Because I'm not running a race. And that's what my brain can kind of you know, and so I read three chapters and then I'm, I'm going to I'm going to commune with the Lord. It's not really intercession. Because intercession is hard work. I'm just going to commune with the Lord and talk to him or may I take a walk. I just I'm just going to spend time with the Lord. I'm going to enjoy myself. It's my safe spot. And it's not a big deal. It's. I don't know, half an hour. But then 
I'm going to have my breakfast. I'm going to do things. And then um, from then on, it's study and prayer with my boots on. It's I'm going to study this many hours in order to understand this thing about Christ or in order to understand this thing about biblical marriage. I'm going to work through texts of the Bible. I'm going to study, study, study. And it it's painful and it's tiring. It's sometimes mind numbing. To work through it. And then there's prayer with your boots on. People tell me they don't like prayer. So the first thing I ask them after knowing that they seem to be converted is talk to me about your prayer life. And most of their prayer life is nothing but kind of a rambling intercession. And I said, well, if all my prayer life was was intercession, I wouldn't too much like it either. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, intercession is hard. It's painful. It's bloody. It's trench work. It really is. So if 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 all your prayer life was just this battle. It would be very difficult to sustain. That's why you need communion where you just delight in God. You see, so so after I, I that I'm, I'm going to study hard and I'm going to intercede and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fight. But I separate in my mind, I have to separate those two things. All right. Thank you, Matt. One of the one of the traps with Bible reading plans, if you get behind, you can kind of be in bondage. You got suddenly twelve days to catch up on, or you're sick for five days, and you can kind of make your own. Um, and I did that years ago. I started in the Old Testament. I'd read two chapters in Genesis, two Psalms, two chapters in Matthew, two chapters in Romans, and I go through the whole Bible that way. I mark what I read, and the next day I start over. You can't get behind. If you miss a day or two, you start over where you left off. So there's real liberty in, in that kind of approach. Paul mentioned about <clears throat> how God uses men some of the best authors for me in my Christian life have been guys who aren't distinctly reformed, but great writers. Uh, find the thick, the works of uh, E.M. Bounds on prayer. It's a thick book, and you can find it probably inexpensively online. It's all of his books on prayer in one. Bounds is profound. I mean, he was a, a Methodist pastor. He was a chaplain in the S Civil War, right? And read Bounds on prayer. But, but then Tozier. I spent a year looking for everything Tozier ever wrote. Most of them are in reprinted in very affordable books. So... Um, Tozier will feed your soul. His book on the attributes of God, knowledge of the holy, is just incomparable. And so, read Tozier. Um, and here's another 20th, 20th century man. He was a Southern Baptist evangelist, Vance Havner. And um, Edward Cook at Kingsley Press has systematically brought back uh, Vance Havner's books that have been out of print. Havner is just rich, simple, stirring, evangelistic road to revival, don't miss your miracle. Some of these titles kind of sound shallow, but Havner wasn't shallow. He was a tremendous man. You could hear him a lot online, some of his sermons, but he's, he's heart stirring. And... Um, you know, we need both the solid theological doctrinal content, but we need devotional stuff that flames our emotions and our heart and will stir us to pray as well. You know, on this table, there's a lot of lesser known biographies. Um, 
Daniel Smith was a missionary to China. And uh, unless you bought this book, you've probably never heard of him. 20th century, an unknown. He was one of those guys, Hebrews 11 talks about, uh, of whom the world was not worthy. And so these are here. If you, if you see some biographies here and you've never heard of them, The Christian Hero, Life of Robert Annan. These lesser known guys are often God's gems. They're the, as Paul would say, the, uh, the run of the litter. They're not impress, uh, impressive to the world, but they're giants with God. So here's another one. The first convert Hudson Taylor saw in China was Pastor Xi, and he was just an astounding man. He was a Confucian scholar, um, and God saved him. And Lloyd-Jones said this about um, this book. I regard it as a classic and one of the really great Christian biographies. To read it is to be searched and humbled, but at the same time it is stimulating and exhilarating and a real tonic to one's faith. So it's a phenomenal book. One of the early converts in China uh, in those days. And then, you know, there's these authors. Some, some men have been much greater writers than they are preachers. And um, Jerry Bridges may be in that category. Tremendous teacher. But his book, really his ministry, uh, they're so rich, they're so solid, they're so applicable, and just tremendously good. So Jerry Bridges is a great, as a young Christian, read Jerry Bridges and he'll, he'll do your soul really, really good. His books are smaller and, and easy to read. There's a lot of these smaller uh, books over here, these, these tiny Banner of Truth, Summaries of some of these Puritans right here. Heaven, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, the Tender Heart, Richard Sibbs. When Christians Suffer, Thomas Case. So there's some little gems over here. And as you, you guys look at the whole table closely, and you'll just see some that will strike you. Um, Randy Alcorn's little book on sexual temptation, establishing guardrails and winning the battle. A very helpful little book. All right, I want Nathan Rages to share some thoughts right now, if you would. Can you just speak up? We don't have a mic. Unless you want to bring him a mic? Well, after all that, I hope I have something to say. Uh, you know, I, I guess one thing I would stress is is that is that your relationship with books has to be an individual thing. You know, Brother Paul can stand up here and tell you exactly how he does it, what he reads. You know, his his system, his method. Well, that that's something that he's arrived at after decades of walking with God, and it's unique to him. So it's not like, well, I can do it just like, just like Paul does it, and I'll, yeah, I'll end up like Paul in other ways. Not necessarily. You know, for each of us, the Lord, the Lord wants us to find what, what works for us. We're all so individual in the area of books. And uh, so I, I can just share just another data point of, of how books have, have influenced uh, my life. I, it, I was saved by God's grace when I was 10 years old, and uh, wonderful Christian parents, and and uh, and and it was it was my high school years that 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 Christian books just became alive to me. Uh, so as a new Christian, like say the age of I don't know fourteen, fifteen years old, I started reading really good stuff, and and uh, <laughs> it'll make me cry to talk about it. But it, you know, Burkhoff Systematic Theology is one of the you know the hardest books I worked through in high school and. And my parents gave me uh, Martin Lloyd Jones Romans commentaries uh, for one of my birthdays in high school, and I worked through that. And 
And uh, I mean, really, really good, substantial stuff. And it, it gave me a, a, finan- a, um, a theological foundation uh, for basically the rest of my life. It's stuff I read as a high school kid. And I was homeschooled, and, and so I had time, time to read and, and really learn. And so, so this, uh, I, if, there's, if there's some younger people in the audience, uh, you might have more time right now in your teenage years or your, your 20s, if you're a single person before you're married maybe, or your life is more simple, you have an opportunity to soak up truth in a way you may never have again in your life. So, so you know, redeem the time. Um, but for me, books have, have been a way, you know, there's that Bible verse to, um, you know, he who walks with wise men will be wise. And it's a way to walk in the ways of wise men, to learn from, from, the, from, the, from the wisest, wisest men of history in terms of their, their godliness and their, their depth of relationship with the Lord. Um, and so, so, you know, just all, all, all different uh, types of, of Christian literature have really helped me. Some, you know, the, the heavy, difficult theology stuff and, the, and just the warm devotional stuff. And, and, you know, books on a certain topic, they're going to help me with, with sermons I'm working on, that kind of thing. Commentaries are helpful. Systematic theology has been really helpful for me, different, different ones. So they're just all different kinds of things that can, that can help you. But, but I want to go back to the, the thing I started with, which is books are individual. It's, it's for you individually, and, and books have a time uh, in your life. I mean, the right book at the wrong time won't do you much good. Uh, but the right book at the right time, you know, when you are ans- asking the questions that that book is, is answering, uh, can be just phenomenal, can be life-changing. Uh, the thing that you need at the time. And, and so to me, the, the way I've tried to solve the timeliness issue is, is I buy a lot of books that I don't immediately read. So, so in my house, I've got maybe 40, 50 books that I've bought that I've, I've only like read, you know, the first chapter, kind of get a feel of what it is. And they're sitting there, you know, and it's not procrastination. It's not something to feel guilty about. It's just, I'm waiting for the right time on those. I kind of know what I have. And there's, and I'm, I'm thinking there's going to be a right time for different ones. Now, some of them you give up on say, well, there'll never be a right time for that one. You pitch it and whatever. But, but, but we need to buy books in order to have books so that it can be the right time. And, and, you, and so maybe you, you, you go home with something that one of, these, one of these men mentioned here. They said it was really great. And you take it home and you start on it. You plow into chapter one and it's kind of okay. And you plow into chapter two and it, it loses an interest. And it's okay. Just put it aside. Put it aside. Maybe it's just not the right time for that one. I mean, there's something else that'll be the right time. And just, just to be sensitive, sensitive, is the Lord, is the Lord using it, is blessing you through that. And if, and if it's not working, it's okay to say this isn't working. I'm going to, going to try something else that maybe, maybe will help me. Uh, so just the, the issue of timeliness and, and, and not being afraid to just to bail out on it. I, I think very often uh, the best part of the book is in the first third. And, uh, you know, if the first third isn't really great, then then the second two-thirds is unlikely to, to be really great for you. Um, and so just, just that thing of just an awareness of, how, of how, what it's doing for you, what you're getting from it, how the Lord's using it. Uh, but anyway, Mac, Mac suggested I just grab a few titles to mention also, as others have mentioned things. Uh, he mentioned uh, Whitney's book on Pray in the Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention Whitney's book on the spiritual disciplines, the Christian life. I think surely a bunch of us here have read this, particularly for, for say, a newer Christian. You know, a book for, you know, a brand new Christian, you know, say the first couple years of their walk with the Lord. This book on spiritual disciplines can be really helpful in just helping somebody get established in, in just good habits as a Christian. And it, it leads to, to much greater spiritual stability to just learn how to, how to you know, intake Scripture, how to pray consistently. But he also deals with things like evangelism and worship and so on. Uh, so what, I've given away a lot of copies of this. Uh, really, really helpful. Um, Jesus, Power Without Measure by Douglas McMillan. This, this book is special because it's really unique. Uh, deals with the, the, the work of the Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus. 
and, and, and brings out the thought that the Lord Jesus did what he did on earth in his ministry by the power of the Spirit. And he did that as an example for us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it, it, for me, it changed my, the way I thought about the Lord Jesus and his ministry and also changed the way I thought about the work of the Spirit in my own life. So this is a really special book recommend to you. And then I, I noticed there are some copies of the, the two-volume biography of Hudson Taylor uh, here. And, uh, and Mac, Mac, back when I was, I think, graduating from high school, Mac gave me a copy of this. Uh, he gave me the, the, the old green antique volumes, I think. And what a wonderful gift. I read those as a young man, and, and they influenced me as a young man. And then the last year, I got those out again and went through them again, and it was it's so rich. This, this is the gold standard uh, for, for devotional biography, is the, the two-volume set of Hudson Taylor by, uh, by, by Dr. and Mrs. Howard Taylor. And I mean, just the ch each chapter is just writ. It feeds your soul in a very special way. And I know it looks big and intimidating, but you don't have to get through it in a month. You can, you can stretch it out as long as you want. It's like each chapter is profitable. And, and the excerpts from Hudson Taylor's letters are just eloquent. He's a wonderful writer and, and the stories are rich. So anyway, I really commend this to you. Don't be intimidated by the size of it. Uh, just go a chapter at a time and you'll feed your soul. I think that's all I have. You have a question? Uh, this is called Jesus, Power Without Measure by Macmillan. Yeah. Anything else? The Hudson Taylor. Am I on? The Hudson Taylor is not intimidating, it's intoxicating. <laughs> it is fabulous. Now, Mrs. Howard Taylor was Hudson Taylor's daughter in law. She became the primary biographer for all the China Inland Mission works. Martyred Missionaries of the China Inland Mission, two volumes. She wrote D.E. Host, his life. She wrote a number of them. Unbelievable gifted writer, Mrs. Howard Taylor. So look for her books online and you can find some choice gems. Nathan didn't mention probably the most important book he read for 20 years, The Living Epistle of Bob Jennings, because he grew up under Bob's ministry. And uh, Bob is speaking here. <laughs> our time is up. We're going to have our hymn singing, right? Michael Thacker over by the piano. And ministers, elders, pastors, missionaries, over to the tally with Paul Washer. Thank you all.